contribution, and I think I belong there pretty well. Uh, anyway, uh, so okay. I'm going to talk about uh, my art in relationship to Sephiroth exclusively today without kind of pretending otherwise. I'm um, a trained as a painter. I used to make paintings and hang them in the museums and gallery in the woods of uh, my life. Until uh, I discovered these guys <clears throat> and through the uh, work of Roger Hamlin, that they are uh, camouflaging in nature and they're creating these body patterns and so on and so on. And which was sort of introduced to me through uh, my daughter, <clears throat> who loved it, this PBS documentary. And I had to watch it hundreds of times because she wanted to watch it over and over again. And while I was watching this uh, video over and over again, I came to this uh, one realization, uh, I am a cuttlefish. <laughs> so let me explain what that means. So I'm an artist. Uh, we look at uh, our life and then take in the information and then process it in ourselves as a filter and take it out as an artwork, basically that is in representation. This is a model that is basically uh, described by Paul Klee. And what cuttlefish does is basically the same thing. They take in the visual information from the surrounding through their sensory organs, and then they process it, and they come out with the body pattern. So these uh, two processes are basically the same thing. Uh, so I started thinking, like, how can I use this system? Maybe cuttlefish body pattern can be used as a kind of interesting comparative model to understand what we do in the visual culture. And I pushed this idea a little bit further. So we live in this physical reality as much as squid is living in a physical reality. However, the world that we actually can perceive and understand is not the physical reality we live in, it's just a part of it. So much as squid's physical world, I mean, they are I mean, understanding the world. Their self world is basically diffracted. And there's an overlap, and, and we make art to try to understand this world that we live in and make, make body pattern. So there's a kind of an interesting overlap in between that. And I thought maybe studying that overlap, we might be able to open up an access to this physical reality which is otherwise metaphysical. Truth or whatever we want to call it. Kind of get into the religious ground, so I'm going to skip into something else. But I hope you kind of get the drift uh, of my hypothesis. So the first thing I did, I live in Minnesota, really cold. Uh, so uh, I got myself a husband suit, and that, that's me, in the middle of the street. And my daughter, if you can see on the left bottom. Uh, that's what happens if you have a dad as an artist. You get to, uh, that's us. <laughs> and to really kind of try to understand what it means to camouflage in the space, and that we actually learn a lot. Uh, by doing this like, empirically, like experiencing, rather than just thinking about it. So from now on, so this is my premise, and uh, now I'm going to talk about set art. So artists, we make drawings. If you don't have access to things, we go through our ideas by making drawings. So this is a show I did in Tokyo, I made a series of drawings. Uh, here are some samples, uh, color pencil drawings. Uh, and this was my original idea. I thought, wow, I show a portrait to cuttlefish and I can make a portrait on their back in the mantle. Which is not the case. Uh, here's another drawing I did. I wanted to know how big uh, Arcturus is, so I just made a, a drawing as big as the real thing. It's one to one scale. The whole thing is a little bit over four meters long. Here's a detail. So I painted all those dots. Just crazy. And I finally had access to actual animals. So what I, the first thing I did was I set up a tank with a, a monitor underneath and put the water in, put the animals in there to show them movies and paintings and photographs and all kinds of things for them to see if they can, with their repertoire of information that they have the capability, can they indeed camouflage into paintings? Here's one example of uh, Frank Arbeck's uh, figure of painting. And here is this for, for us. <laughs> so they did pretty well. There are many other things, but uh, this is one of the elite. So I made this into a series of photographs that was a resin coated images of 61 panels of different images of different cuttlefish panels on the city of Oroms. And this is the show I did was a piece of video installation with uh, images on the wall uh, in the museum in Japan. 
And I like showing things at museum, kind of makes me more important official. But I also like showing in an uh, alternative place. This is a show I did in the meat market in Okinawa. So I do a projection on the meat market shop. So I'll hide my pieces above a butcher and things like that. So regular people can kind of experience these things. It was odd to see a big Verona serving through a meat market. And sometimes I use the same data set and then try to aestheticize it even more so I can kind of keep my position at university as an art artist. <laughs> Different samples of that. And as I was getting access into um, uh, for Ornus, Sophia I also had access to different species, and this is Sephiotutus. I'm showing them in Star Wars. So it looks like a kind of evil spaceship that just blew up a yeah, thing. So. But uh, Sephia Foranus drew when I was watching Star Wars. I worked with an octopus. Um, I learned that uh, they like to collect things in dens. So I thought, well, oh, that's great. I'll make them do the work, and then I'll pretend. So they'll I, I gave a lot of Japanese anime figures to them, and they rearranged things. And then what, what I wanted to do was have an archaeological museum space where I'll rearrange the object based on the data I get from Octopus. I'll change it as they would change it. He didn't get to the point, nobody bought that proposal for me. <laughs> but I got some cool vision. And I moved on to the idea of communication from a camouflage. And I want to know if these uh, body patterns are actually transmitting codified information, that would be really cool. That, that gets me a little bit closer to what I do as a painter. So the first thing I did was I painted uh, all these models, I made the models and showed them to uh, for all this to see if I get the consistent response from them. And uh, I made a sort of tracking data of it and I realized that it's kind of a nice abstract painting that I can make from tracking data. And uh, I moved on to these guys. Again, I learned that uh, there's a uh, bunch of deep sea species that are communicating using um, uh, bioluminescence. And it's, I find some images like this in the internet, it just like gets me going, like, I gotta work with these guys. But anyway, uh, again, there's a uh, deep sea species and it's, I don't have access to these guys, so I actually bug my curriculum and I said, I wanna see these guys. And he said, just come over and I'll show you things. So I went over to his lab and then I started looking at different things and made a series of photo series. I love this thing. I love my face. It looks like you're right up to me. Uh, and then I convinced the fisherman in Japan and said, please take me out with you guys. Uh, I'll do the work on the boat so I can just do my, I also do my work. Uh, so they finally convinced I got off to this uh, commercial fishing vessel with this thing, uh, fly fishing, uh, Firefly is a good communication module. It's a, it's a model with LED with different frequency attached to it, and I wanted to have a conversation with the Firefly squid. So this is how it looks in the lid. I made a whole bunch of them, it was a good deal. Uh, one of the most difficult things is as soon as I throw this in the water, seagull comes in text. <laughs> <laughs> so before I had a time to go sink deep enough, it, it's, I lost a lot of these. And I'll bring something back uh, from the boat and then do ex uh, experiments. And, like shoot this one and Firefly Squid is watching video to see if I can get anything going. But what I really wanted to do is this. <coughs> so if I, I, this is a fish tank that is, this spells out that word. And uh, my original intention was to put a lot of the Firefly Squid into this thing and make this sign glow like a neon sign. And if this works, then I'll make it a bigger version in the ocean with using a big net so we can have a message from a squid from the ocean to people who live around the, the bay. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. But by being on the boat and working with these guys, I realized it's not possible. And then aside from that, it doesn't glow that bright. So anyway, I made a tank and it's sitting in my parents' basement. <laughs> and then finally, um, I came across this image. I took this photo. Um, and uh, it was a camouflage experiment, but what happened was that this peculiar similarity between the, the chromatic components that created in cuttlefish and this African mask. Uh, it has the lines in front, dark eyes around the eye wings around, and model patterns on the back, and so on. It even has a blue line around the, the edge. So I thought, okay, these 
this sign needs to, it's basically produced to kind of uh, make up of others a struggle or fear. So fear response. So there's some kind of fear response uh, uh, consistency here that is uh, almost uncanny. So I thought, okay, I'm going to investigate this thing. So what I did was I went out on the internet and found a thousand hundred zombies and made a chromatic component of these guys. Because the basic zombie is a visual embodiment of our fear as an interspecies of communications. So I, I kind of put it together, chromatic components, this, like uh, scientists, and, and uh, did a statistic analysis of these things, and uh, see what happens, and I found out uh, that they are dominant components. So if you want to be zombie in next Halloween, you need to have that dominant component. <laughs> Also, some dominant components, if you are not drunk enough or you have a little extra time and you want to embellish your uh, costume, that's the subdominant component. So basically, what you see on the left is the archetype of a zombie, which induces fear in us. And then extra things, if you wanted to, add to it, which gives us basically 12 kind of different combinations, possible combinations of what creates fear into interspecific uh, visual communication. So, the African mass, the Kofis, the Pifras, zombie, all shared basic chromatic components, visual information, which did the exact function that it's intended to do. So, I pushed this idea a little bit more, and there's, I don't know if you're familiar with a costume play. These people dress up in different costumes. And I have a friend that does this professionally, so I sent her an image of a cuttlefish to her to see what happened. So I said, well, if these are this picture of squid, can you be a squid? So this was her interpretation of a squid. And obviously, as the image becomes more agonistic or dynamic, uh, it's getting closer to zombie-like um, representation. Connecting dots. So as you can tell, like, a lot of my work at this point cannot be done like a painter in the studio. When I was a painter, I'd go into the studio and like, paint and come back. Uh, but now I work with a lot of people, so I'll show you a few different projects very quickly. Uh, here's a project I did in Japan. I had actual tag it in the Science Museum as a filter system and so on. I had a video feeding, 24-hour streaming video on the Visa tank, which Colorfish is reacting to, which is videotaped to get from top, projected on the gigantic sphere that is suspended in space. So the people can actually look at constant changes of a body pattern based on streaming video that's coming through, which is also changing. So this is a little cute uh, that watching video and the sphere in the back. And in, in addition to this uh, piece, um, since it was a scientific museum, I proposed I work with a bunch of kids making something. So I wanted to teach them about uh, the squid, how they change body patterns, and also related to uh, pixel art. So by com combining pixel, you can make images. So what I did was I got uh, thousands of water balloons and uh, worked with the elementary school kids to make uh, Arcturus getting attacked by a sperm whale image. And here's the detail of that. And what are you going to do with you know, 5,000 water balloons? Uh, so here's the kids uh, uh, putting these things together. So after, after it was so much work to complete it, we took them apart and we went outside. And, <laughs> uh, and so it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is a series of work I did was at Minneapolis Institute of Art. They wanted to work with me on something. So what I did was uh, I worked on their permanent collections. And then I showed this permanent collection to competition. We got a body pattern. So the audience come to the museum can see both the original and also the interpretations that are created by Colorfish. And uh, I'm working uh, patterns, chain, uh, green. And then for fun, I made these. Uh, I, I kind of basically switched the idea. I painted Colorfish with uh, images that you find in culture, like a Buddhist mantra, all of that. This is which got me a model pattern. So it's nothing spectacular. It's a Buddhist mantra, it's basically a model pattern. Or uh, Eddie Van Halen's guitar, which is basically disruptive. Uh, Picked it on that. Or uh, uh, Sanskrit, uh, Tibetan Sanskrit for esoteric Buddhism. And here 
is that exhibition view? <laughs> Those photographs are about two meters long, and there are six of them in space. Uh, that's actually 24 karat gold cuttlefish if anybody wants to buy it. Right now, it's my, my daughter is a uh, toy. <laughs> snuck one into Tokyo University Med School, the MRI, CT scan, so I've got some information, I, I, I've got access to that, I made a wireframe of Arcturus, and here's the detail, and then 3D printed it, so that's a 3D print, probably the first and the last uh, 3D print of Arcturus from MRI images, and it's coded with a traditional Japanese stack. They even made a special box. Uh, few new projects. Uh, I just kind of finished this. Um, uh, there's a program um, in uh, uh, Saga Prefecture, Japan, that wanted to collaborate between the university and the industries and so on. So there's a fishing lure company and a high school and tennis lab, and I collaborated together. Basically, we wanted to make an ROV that shapes like a squid. But nobody knew how to do this. I don't know anything about robotics. But I got these things and I put this thing together. There's a two GoPro cameras and I. And I hope you would you like it. It's kind of like the, I don't know, one of them. Uh, the octopus is good. Anyway, so I put this thing together and now I sewed up this uh, uh, Sephiroturus shape. They want it to be a Sephiroturus. And I said, no, it's not going to work, but they really want it. And then here is that us testing. <laughs> It's so big, and I think the whole idea is to be less invasive, but look at that thing, it's just crazy, that's going to drive all the other squid away. <laughs> There's a little tilted motors and, and a camera, and it swims around, and here's a little video. It's not, it's not good. It's, it looks like a, a dying architectus in Japanese bed. <laughs>